And without further ado, our research to practice lecture, Head and Neck Cancer Management in North Carolina, updates for 2021 with Wendell Yarbrough, MD, MMHC, FACS. So uh, welcome, Dr. Yarbrough. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Great, we are so pleased to have you here. Let me let our audience know a little bit about you. Um, you currently, you serve as the chair at the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery and the Thomas J. Dark, you're the Thomas J. Dark Distinguished Professor of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. And before returning to UNC, Section Chief of Otolaryngology at the Department of Surgery, Yale University School of Medicine, and Director of Head and Neck Disease Center uh, head and Neck Disease Center at Smillo Cancer Hospital and co-director of Virus and Other Infection Associated Cancers Program at Yale Cancer Center. And uh, Dr. Yarborough, you, you came to the University of North Carolina as a Moorhead Scholar, studied here, left us for a while, and uh, then came back to us in 2018. Is that right? That's right. I'm so happy to come back. It was a big circle for me. Well, well, we are very fortunate to have you. I'll let uh, uh, those who would like read the full bio, and that'll be uh, there as, and then the slides as well. But um, what's, what's one more thing we should know about you maybe that, that wasn't on that professional bio? Um, well, um, I'm a Tar Heel through and through, so I apologize to those Duke fans out there. I was glad to see the Tar Heels get another victory last night. So. Um, I do, I'm a pretty avid follower of uh, college um, sports related to UNC, and as my wife says, I'm a, a nerdmismatic, uh, which is a really a numismatic, which is uh, I collect coins. Oh, very good, very good. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let's see. I, I mentioned we're going to use uh, poll everywhere. This is just a practice question. I, th I think everyone's going to get this. Uh, uh, but the question is, head and neck cancers include cancers of the mouth, nose, sinuses, salivary glands, and throat. And if you think that's true, you're going to put an A, and, and false is B. And uh, while that'll pop up in just a second. And while we're waiting, I'll say that uh, this activity has been planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course directors in association with the UNC Office of Continuing Professional Development, William Wood, MD, MPH, and CPD staff have no relevant financial relationships with commercial, rela with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. And Wendell Yarbrough, MD, MMHC, FACS, has no financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. And so there's our question. Again, head and neck cancer includes cancers of the mouth, nose, sinuses, salivary glands, and throat. Uh, Dr. Yarbrough, I'm, I'm seeing a trend here. How are they doing? <laughs> seems, seems like so far so good. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, we're off to a great start. Uh, with that, I will uh, go ahead and turn it over to you. Advances in head and neck cancer management in North Carolina. Updates for 2021. Uh, take it away, Dr. Yarbrough. All right. Well, thanks, Tim. And um, I'm glad to see that... Um, um, the response was the way it is related to the question. You're already ahead of a lot of people who have no idea what head and neck cancer means. Um, we've done polls in uh, 2012, and then again, we did one in 2018, sort of the general population. And um, the knowledge base for head and neck cancers is very low in the population. Uh, it has improved between 2012 and 2018, so, so we're seeing some improvement, even knowing what a head and neck cancer is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, um, and I think we can go ahead to the next slide. A little bit about me before then, as you can see, and, and Tim went through this, um, but basically I was at UNC for a long time, and then I went left to Vanderbilt, and then to Yale, and then made a full circle back to UNC, and this is this is my family over here on the right, um, all, um, two sons and my wife, uh, Glenn. So yeah, feel free to go ahead. Um, so a few objectives today. We want to discuss um, the importance of multidisciplinary treatment of head and neck cancer um, with some emphasis on some new techniques and some treatment um, standards. We're going to explain reconstructive head and neck techniques in the head and neck uh, for head and neck cancer, and that's really important just because um, 
the, the reconstruction is complex and we have to restore function and form. And um, we're going to identify um, a little bit of the cutting edge stuff that our labs work on related to prognostic markers and emerging therapeutic vulnerabilities for HPV associated head and neck cancer. All right. All right. And I'll, I'll just mention with this uh, poll here, uh, let's see, and I'm actually um, not sure that it's popping up the, the question that, that we hope to, but I think you had wanted to, to, to get one word that, to, to describe people's uh, experience with head and neck cancer. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, what you think of when you think of head and neck cancer, if you can just uh, type in a word, I think we're going to do a, one of those word mosaics. Right. There, and there we go. They're oh, already coming go. in. And I apologize. We, uh, we don't have uh, the ability to take phrases, but if you'll just limit it to one word, uh, it's, it's nice because we can see which ones uh, appear the most frequently yeah. there. And uh, boy, yeah, scary is, is already showing and bad showing up as the, the dominant ones already. Yeah, a lot of good stuff there. It looks like it's coming up. Um, laryngectomies, problems with eating and feeding, surgical, painful, scary, bad. Yeah, smoker. Yep. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, radiation. Yeah, a lot of different ways to treat it showing up. Some morbidity. Um, yeah, I really like that. Be nice to capture that. We can use it in future <laughs> for future things. That's 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 really great. We'll send that on to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. So uh, one more question, boy. We're getting all the questions out of the way pretty early. Um, what are the major causes of head and neck cancer? So we have a few choices here: A is the human papillomavirus and tobacco. B is herpes simplex virus and tobacco, Epstein-Barr virus and tobacco, tobacco and environmental pollution, or COVID vaccines. We probably think the COVID vaccine will probably win this one. As <laughs> All right. All right. So looks, looks like most people have pretty much nailed this one too. Um, what, what people aren't aware of is the virus uh, association with head and neck cancer lots of times. So we're going to talk about that through the lecture a little bit. All right, so just a little bit of an overview. Um, uh, once again, thanks to everyone who's come and, um, you know, it's really nice to have people who are interested in learning about head and neck cancer. It is a a fairly common cancer that doesn't get as much press as some of the others. There's more than 60,000 cases in the United States every year. If you include thyroid cancer in that, which we also treat, that's about another close to 60,000. So then um, you're talking a little bit bigger numbers. The vast majority of the cancers that we're talking about um, are squamous cell carcinomas, um, and it's classified by subsites. And this is why people aren't as aware of it. It's divided into all these different subsites. Um, and when you look at each subsite individually, there's not as many numbers but, uh, associated with each subsite. So I think you can hit the next side, slide. We have a little animation. We're going to be mainly talking about these today, this larynx, oropharynx, oral cavity, and hypopharynx. Almost all of these are squamous cell carcinomas. And these, the two main molecular subtypes, are of these um, tumors are based on the causative agent, uh, tobacco being one and HPV being another. Um, so just when you're contrasting tobacco associated head and neck cancer with HPV or human papillomavirus associated head and neck cancer, tobaccos are decreasing and HPV associated are increasing. And this is really a tribute to our um, um, smoking cessation efforts that have been going on over many years. Um, and smoking is decreasing in the United States. And so you can see the red line here is the tobacco associated cancers. And in the late 80s, um, into the 90s and through the 2000s, that has been decreasing, and that's really nice to see. Um, but 
as that was decreasing, a new type of head and neck cancer associated with younger patients, decreased or absent traditional risk factors, meaning tobacco or alcohol, has been increasing. And it's really increasing uh, at sort of a epidemic type increase. And that's the black line here. Okay, we can go to the next. One interesting thing about these two types of uh, tumors is they are associated with different survival. So you can see overall survival in, on the left and progression-free survival on the right. The HPV positive tumors and, and the dark line is the median and the confidence intervals are the gray lines. So you can see that HPV positive tumors do a lot better for both overall survival and progression-free survival compared to HPV negative tumors. So in addition to survival, there's several other differences between these tumors. The HPV positive tumors are occur in younger patients compared to HPV negative. The average age is still in the 50s, but with HPV negative, it's in the 60s. HPV positive cancers have different risk factors, of course. They're associated with HPV, which is a sexually transmitted virus. And HPV negative cancers are, uh, are associated with tobacco or alcohol use. The HPV positive cancers are more responsive to therapy, like we talked about, and have an increased cure rate compared to HPV negative cancers. But still, 25% or so of these tumors will recur. There are some conserved gene alterate, um, alterations that are different between these two tumors. HPV negative cancers have the typical P53, P16, EGFR uh, mutations, whereas the HPV positive cancers have these novel gene defects, some more methylated gen uh, genome and a di distinct gene expression profile. You can hit the next one, but we're going to talk a little bit about TRAF and CYLD later in the, um, in the talk. So just keep those in the back of your mind, TRAF3 and CYLD. Okay. So tobacco-associated cancers occur at all subsites that we talked about. Oral cavity and larynx are the most common. The incidence in the United States is decreasing for these, as we talked about, because smoking is decreasing. So that's really a great thing for our uh, population health. Advanced tumors are still associated with really poor prognosis, less than 50% cure for our advanced stage cancers. And is treated primarily with surgery or with radiation with or without chemotherapy or with surgery and radiation with or without chemotherapy. So the treatment modalities are very intense for this. And this, this speaks to the need for multidisciplinary teams because a lot of our patients are treated by all these modalities. You go to the next. So HPV associated head and neck cancers occur in the or oropharynx. So this means the tonsil region and the base of the tongue almost exclusively. The incidence is increasing, as we talked about. Now it's more than 25% of all the head and neck cancers that we see. And they're associated with a better prognosis than tobacco associated, somewhere in the 70 to 80% cure range overall. And treatment modalities are still the same, though, treated with surgery and or radiation with or without concurrent chemotherapy. So I'll show you this slide because what this is is a list of all the HPV-associated um, cancers in the United States. And this was data from 2008 to 2012. And the reason I show you this, you can go to the next, is because of this. Oropharynx has 11,000 cases in that time frame uh, each year. And that is more frequent than uterine cervical cancer, which is the first one on the list. So in that time frame between 2008 and 2012, oropharynx cancer became the most common HPV-associated cancer in the United States, surpassing uterine cervical cancer. All right, next. So this is always a good time to mention the vaccine 
if you know of anyone that hasn't been vac vaccinated and is younger than 45, which the vaccine is approved for, then encourage them to do that. But particularly um, um, our youngsters and uh, teenagers and um, actually down to age nine, um, is the vaccine is recommended for both boys and girls. Um, right now, it's a non-valent vaccine. It includes all of the oncogenic, the top oncogenic types and two benign types of HPV. And most importantly for head and neck cancer, it includes HPV type 16, which is the, kind, the, the HPV that causes almost all head and neck cancers. It has been shown to decrease oral HPV infection, which should decrease the rate of HPV-associated head and neck cancer. So um, I mentioned the different modalities used to treat head and neck cancer. Um, and I just want to um, stress that multidisciplinary care is really important. So if there's an, um, um, a, um, an area that wants to treat head and neck cancer, you need input from all of these specialists, you can see otolaryngology, medical oncology, radiation oncology, radiology, pathology, oral medicine, speech language pathology, nursing, nutrition, APP, social work, navigator, smoke cessation, you can read there, but um, it's a big job. And the reason it's a big job is because there's so many, um, so much uh, difficulty with getting these patients through this aggressive therapy. And it's so important to get them through this aggressive therapy because if they delay their therapy or during therapy, it's the multidisciplinary team is associated with improved survival and better functional outcomes. So that's why this whole team is needed. And um, we're really fortunate to have a really great team. I'm going to show you some of them in the next few slides. Um, this is the head and neck surgeons. Um, you can see we have a big group of people doing head and neck surgery. Uh, Samit Patel is our division chief. Um, but we do both the extirpation and the reconstruction. So um, the, the part of the team is for taking out the tumor, part of the team is for putting things back together. Head and neck medical oncology. Um, we have uh, three great medical oncologists. Dr. Weiss leads this group, and, and um, we have a lot of clinical trials. We're going to show those probably in a second or two. But uh, Dr. Patel and Dr. Sheth are um, younger um, and more recently joined, but real um, go-getters. So we, we have a, a really great team here. Radiation oncology, Dr. Chera and Dr. Shin. Dr. Chera leads some of the de-escalation trials using lower doses of radiation um, that have um, been shown to be effective in HPV-associated cancers. And you can go on to the next. Um, pathology. We have a head and neck specific pathologist. Um, Dr. Um, Maygarden, Dr. Uh, Askin, um, and Dr. Somolsky, as well as Dr. Scott Smith and Dr. Singer, um, all are involved in this. Dr. Askin was the chair here at UNC years ago, went to Hopkins to be the chair, and sort of like me, did a big circle and came back. Uh, radiology, um, we have head and neck specific radiologists, uh, Dr. Jules and Dr. Wang. Um, and we're, we're so fortunate to have this because a lot of our treatment decisions are, are based on the uh, imaging studies and the extent of the tumor. Um, we have oral medicine experts, and this is really important because um, some of the treatments we get, particularly chemotherapy and radiation, have a lot of oral effects and, and side effects for teeth and chewing and uh, oral health. Speech language pathology, work with them on almost all of our patients related to speech and swallowing primarily. Um, Brian Kanapke has been here a long time, and, and CC is a newer addition, but still has been here for a while. And some of the stuff they do um, not only is, is related to speech and swallowing, but also trismus. Um, some of the treatments we give, and uh, particularly radiation therapy, can cause trismus. Surgery can do it as well. But there's all kinds of devices to try to 
stretch out the, the chewing muscles basically so that um, people can open their mouth um, wider. These are some of the clinical trials I was talking about earlier. I'm not going to go through them, but just be aware we have a lot of clinical trials, not only for um, recurrent metastatic disease after tumors come back, but also for upfront treatment. And we have some um, investigator-initiated trials uh, related to some new therapies that we are trying to determine who they're effective for and how effective they are. So very active trials group. Our residents are important because they do a lot of the care for our patients who um, get admitted to the hospital after surgery. We have a big group of residents, of course, and you can go to the next slide. Also important are fellows. We work in conjunction with a lot of these fellows um, because sometimes our tumors cross into the lateral skull base with neurotology. Sometimes there's um, facial um, aspects that are involved with facial plastics. Our head and neck microvascular reconstruction um, fellow, Andrew Coniglio, is shown here as well. And then for anterior skull base, where some of our tumors cross as well, there's two fellows that are listed there, Dr. Miller and Dr. Morse. All right, so now we're going to switch gears, talk a little bit about reconstruction for head and neck cancer, since we've gotten some of the... Um, some of the um, initial ideas. Often you see a, a question there. I appreciate people already answering. What's the first goals for reconstruction of head and neck cancer defects? All right, we got, um, looks like a, a majority looking at for function and healing. All right, well, let's uh, go on to the next slide. All right, so the head and neck area and there's just a, a schematic over to the right that shows it's pretty complex there's there's a lot of different types of tissues involved muscles nerves bone soft tissue epithelial lining salivary production um, so um, a, a lot of a lot of important things there but um, what's really important for us as we're thinking about reconstruction is healing and restoration of function um, so one of those functions we're primarily concerned with are eating, breathing, vision, facial expression, and talking. There's some really high value real estate. When I was at Yale and lecturing to the um, medical students, I'd give them a, a little ball that was two centimeters in diameter. And I'd ask them to put it, if they had to have a cancer anywhere in their body, where would they put it? And almost nobody put it in their tongue or on their mouth or in their neck. Um, or in their eye or, or in their nose, you know, they would put it on their leg or somewhere else. So nobody wants a tumor in this area because it, it, it's, um, it affects your uh, airway, your, your eyes, your brain, your swallowing, your ability to communicate, palate, lips, and your cosmetic appearance. So um, as mentioned, you know, it's difficult to cover this area up. If you have a scar on your arm or leg, you can wear, a, you know, something with sleeves or a long, long pants. But if you have a scar on your face or on your neck, it's, it's hard to cover that up. And nerve defects are, are obvious as well um, because uh, facial expression is so important. Um, for reconstruction, we need lots of different types of tissue. As I mentioned before, sometimes we need all of these things for reconstruction. So it's a, it's a complex area to reconstruct from uh, a function and form standpoint. All right, let's go to the next slide. When we start to reconstruct these uh, defects, we think about a ladder of reconstruction. The simplest is at the bottom of the ladder and the more complex is at the top of the ladder. And we consider the patient when we start talking about how we're gonna reconstruct. The health status and their age sometimes if for older patients that may not be able to withstand a longer operation, we may go with a simpler reconstruction. And, but it's always a little bit of a trade-off between function and the complexity of the reconstruction. Are you going to need post-operative radiation therapy, in which case we need to cover critical vessels? And, um, and if you're not going to need that, maybe we can do a simpler reconstruction. So you can see from the very bottom is where secondary intention is just letting it heal. Primary intention is basically closing it. 
skin grafts or a, a, where you um, cover it with a, another piece of tissue, of course. We have tissue expansion, local tissue transfer that can be pedicled, uh, distant tissue transfer, and free tissue transfer. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about a few of these, and um, there's some, uh, just to warn people, there's, I think, some um, pictures coming up that are surgical pictures. I don't think they're, they're not too bad to me, but just, just to let people know. All right, so this is a, a reconstruction using uh, skin graft uh, or alloderm, which is cadaveric dermis. And basically, sometimes you, you, you have a small defect, you can cover it with skin graft or uh, alloderm. What that lets it do, it prevents the scarring so that, in this case, the tongue would not be tethered. And it can remucosalize, so it gives a very nice covering. So you can go to the next slide. This is local, local flaps that we do. This guy had a, um, a lip cancer of his lower lip, so we had to take off more than a third of his lower lip, and we just used part of the upper lip to swing down. This is still pedicled, and after a few weeks, we'll cut the pedicle, and it will have recreated um, uh, its own blood supply from uh, the lateral edges. So we, we do some of these local flaps as well. This is a pedicle flap, and this is a little bigger reconstruction. Um, but you can see here we use tissue off the chest that's based on a blood vessel, and we just tunnel it under the skin. Um, you can see in the upper right um, the defect where the you can see the tongue um, basically that's um, um, in, in the mouth there. Part of the tongue and the pharynx have been resected, and we're basically going to use the skin in the lower left picture to reline the, the pharynx, the throat, and a part of the tongue. Um, and bottom right is how it looks when it's all closed up. Um, and although it looks pretty bad, um, I guess, during the surgery, um, next slide, people heal up pretty well. This is him about a year later. You can barely see the incision on his chin. Um, he can, you know, his tongue doesn't, isn't symmetric because we removed part of it, but he can stick out his tongue. He's eating and he's talking and he's um, working. So um, these reconstructions can, can do a very good job. Next slide. Um, I really want to talk a little bit about free flaps because um, free flaps are our most versatile flaps. Um, we have a lot of flap surgeons, so we're very uh, facile at using various flaps, depending on what's needed for reconstruction. We do more than 200 flaps every year, and we can bring up soft tissue only, bone only, bone and soft tissue, um, skin along with bone and soft tissue. And the idea is, what do we need to maximize the function and, and recreate the form um, and restore appearance? All right, so we can go to the next slide. Um, this is um, just showing us we can do preoperative planning based on CT scans. So um, what you see on the left is a, a schematic of a mandible being reconstructed um, with a, a bone from the scapula. The, and uh, on the right, you can just see the models that are created in plastic. Basically, uh, the, the model on the left there is um, the mandible that's been, re after reconstruction, how it's supposed to look. And on the right is the model of the scapula. And in between this, you can see a scapular free flap where it's been pre-cut, pre-attached to bars, so that when we put it uh, into the patient, it fits their mandible um, and can just be screwed in. And then this uh, pedicle uh, tissue can then be sewn in to, to close the defect. Here's an example of a maxillectomy. So you can see right next to the superior tooth there, um, basically we removed a cancer um, and there's a big defect. We need to separate the nose from the mouth so we can use tissue to do that. This is another scapular free flap. Um, and we can go to the next slide. And basically over on the left, you can see um, how, we, how we fashion that. Uh, free flap. And on the right, you can see a post-operative picture. Now, this is still still healing. Um, it, it's right now is pretty full, um, but we can go to the next slide. And you can see over time, it, it, it basically, as it heals, it retracts and eventually ends up looking 
you know, not quite like a normal palate, but pretty good. And, you know, for us, the main thing is separating the nose from the mouth and allowing people to talk and swallow. And this, um, this reconstruction does a very good job. Um, this is uh, just a, um, a, a different maxillectomy defect. And what you can see is after the surgery, sometimes we get CT scans and do 3D reconstruction to see how the defect is looking and to see if everything's appropriate. It can be adjusted if, if not. Um, but on the right, you can see a 3D recon of this person's reconstruction of their palate. Here's a defect that's more complex because not only does it include the palate, but it includes skin, it includes bone, and it includes part of the nose and the face. So you can see this is an, a free flap that has bone, soft tissue, and skin. It's being brought up, and these vessels are hooked into vessels um, in the neck or, in the, or, or on the face. And next slide. This is how he looked immediately post-operatively. You can see part of his nose and, and this flaps on his face and goes all the way up to his lower eyelid. Um, with time, this flap's going to decrease in size. And you can see he, here he's a, a month or two months um, out from surgery, and he's doing pretty well. This flap's going to continue to decrease in size, and we can also um, um, do secondary surgeries to try to make the form of that better. So now I want to switch gears just a little bit more um, and um, talk a little bit about some practice steps that we have for HPV-associated head and neck cancer. Um, we have um, patients that do very well with this tumor, but we can't separate them from people who don't do well. Right now, all, the only thing that's used clinically is whether or not you were a smoker and you smoked for more than 10 pack years, which means one pack per day for 10 years. So in reality, we're over-treating some patients and under-treating others. And we don't know how to safely de-intensify therapy. We have several options for that de-intensification, including transoral robotic surgery, decreased radiation dose or fields, and neoadjuvant therapy, which means some chemotherapy that may um, decrease the need for surgery and or radiation. Um, but we need to, we need to determine how to identify the right patients to de-escalate therapy for. Next slide. So I'm just going to focus a little bit on um, these areas at the top with the next few slides. Next slide. Um, so our goals with de-escalation of therapy are to decrease the dose of delivery of chemotherapy and radiation, to minimize the invasiveness of surgery, um, and the reason we need to do this is because our aggressive therapy can have long-term morbidity or even mortality. Some people, are, we think, are even dying from late effects of their treatment, primarily related to aspiration and possibly pneumonia developing. We need prognostic markers to choose what to de-escalate. So our lab started working on this. Go ahead to the next slide. And um, before I, I get to what our lab did, um, this is just the transoral robotic surgery, and it's, it's a newer technique where we can use a robot to see around the corner and basically do a good resection of a primary tumor. This is a patient with a robot who has some instruments in the patient's mouth. Next slide. This is the way the room's set up. So the surgeon's actually in the upper left at a console looking at what you see in the lower right and making uh, cuts to, to remove the tumor. The people in the OR and the Do lower it. left, that's all right. People in the OR and the lower left are, um, can see what's going on, and there's always somebody at the head of the patient to, to help out with um, anything that's needed there. So now we go to the next slide. This is a patient who Do had it. the surgery. You got it. Nice to know. If you do and you don't have it, nice to know. Okay. Um, well, um, his, um, his picture was actually there, but, but um, that's okay. He did very well. He had transoral robotic surgery, and he was talking about getting screened for head and neck cancer. We do yearly free screenings and um, um, really trying to get the word out about what head and neck cancer is. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. 
So I showed something like this before, but um, the difference here is these are only HPV-associated cancers in the intermediate risk and the low risk. And the only difference between a low-risk HPV-associated cancer and an intermediate-risk HPV-associated cancer is whether or not you smoked more than 10 pack years. And you can see the survival difference, and this is overall survival. The survival of difference uh, is pretty, pretty marked between those two things. But there's still a lot of people who smoke who do very well, and a lot of people who don't smoke who have recurrences. So as we started looking at this in lab, we were involved in a sequencing effort through the Cancer Genome Atlas, which was sponsored by the NCI. And we noted that HPV-associated cancers had mutations in this gene called TRAF3. I told you we would come back around to that. Um, this is a regulator of NF-kappa B and innate immunity, and deep deletions were found in this gene in, different, in addition to mutations. Um, go ahead to the next slide. So CYLD is a gene that has similar functions as TRAF3, and we also found that head and neck cancers that were associated with HPV had defects, defects in CYLD. Next slide. Um, here's just a representation of how many patients have defects in these genes, and you can see overall about 28% or 14% with TRAF3 defects and 14% with CYLD defects have about 28% of all HPV-associated tumors have defects in these genes. Next slide. Now, this is in contrast to HPV-negative tumors where only about 4 or 5% of patients have defects in these genes. So we, we really think that these genes are specific to HPV-associated cancers. Next. Our lab found that the defects in these genes are associated with episomal HPV as opposed to integrated HPV. And the slides below just show that if you have mutant TRAF3 or CYLD on the left, then you are more likely to have no integration than if you have wild-type TRAF3 or CYLD. And, and the reason this is important is because um, in uterine cervical cancer, HPV has been shown to cause cancer by integration into the genome. So in other words, in order for it to cause cancer, HPV is thought to have to integrate into the cancer cells' genes um, but in head and neck cancer, it looks like a, a large number of these um, HPV existing outside of the genome, just as a circle of DNA, can also cause cancer. Next slide. Um, the interesting thing is, if you look at tumors that have wild-type TRAF3 and CYLD, their survival compared to patients who have mutant TRAF3 and CYLD is very different. So the red line here is the mutant TRAF3 and CYLD, and you can see their survival is much better than the blue line, which is the wild-type TRAF3 CYLD, or the black line, which are those patients that do not have HPV-associated cancers but have tobacco-associated cancers. So we think defects in these genes basically are predicting which patients are going to do well or which patients are not going to do well. Next slide. Just to switch gears now a little bit, um, I want to talk a little bit about salivary cancers. And um, salivary cancers um, are not are pretty rare cancers, but we do see them. And the, the, the problem with salivary cancers is they're usually in critical areas, particularly the parotid, which is the salivary gland on your face. Um, the nerve to the face runs right through that gland. So when these tumors are being removed, Sometimes people are, and we are very concerned too, about the facial nerve. But the first goal has always got to be to remove the tumor. If these are cancers and you don't remove all the cancer, it'll come back and then it'll, it'll take the facial nerve out. So this is actually a patient that I saw who had had two prior surgeries with a, a salivary cancer. And 
the reason the tumor kept coming back was because somebody, the, the, the other surgeons did not want to sacrifice the facial nerve. So when the patient saw me, basically this is a, a, a picture um, after we have removed the tumor. And you can see the in the upper right, you can see the facial nerve. The lower divisions are totally intact. But the upper divisions we sacrificed, both, both of the upper division branches. Um, we did reconstruct uh, um, the um, up one of the upper division branches using another nerve from the body and just uh, sutured it back together. And then we reconstructed with um, collagen or basically alloderm to fill in the defect. So we removed this tumor. The patient did very well and did not have the tumor come back. So next slide. And here she is. So, you know, she's got young kids. She doesn't want to have this tumor come back and, and take her life. She, she said her primary goal was to see these guys grow up and, and live their lives. And even though we sacrificed her upper divisions with the reconstruction, you can see in the upper right, she can still get eye closure. Her mouth uh, has a little asymmetry, um, but, but not terrible. Overall, she's very happy. You can see in the bottom with her smile, she, she sort of has a, 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 a asymmetric smile, sort of like Elvis. But, uh, but doing very well, and she's very happy. Um, we do worry about cosmesis in a pride of tumors. Um, our first goal is to remove the tumor, and um, second goal is to preserve the facial nerve function if we can. But the third goal is also, um, you can see how some of these patients can look sunken in after the tumor is taken out. What gives you the side of your face fullness is this parotid gland, and if you remove it, you can look sunken in. Also, the direction of the scar, you can see on the right, you know, the scar coming down to the neck, especially in younger people who heal more aggressively, can, can be noticeable. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things we do for cosmetic removal of these tumors. Next slide. Um, we do uh, um, basically a facelift type approach um, for some patients. And you can see on the left picture on the left, um, the incision comes in front of the ear, goes behind the ear, and then close to the hairline at the back. So basically by, um, by making this incision and then elevating the skin up, we can reach the parotid, remove the tumor, and then close this back. We do use uh, fillers. You can see there the collagen filler so that people do not look sunken in. Next slide. And so you can see here, you know, she looks pretty good after her surgery. Her face works. Um, th this third from the left picture is really the money shot. She doesn't look sunken in. You can barely see any scar. If you pull her ear forward, you can see the scar behind her ear um, where we did the incision. Next slide. This is just another patient. Once again, the money shot's the upper right one. That's the three-quarter view. Does not look sunken in there. The scar is very well hidden. You can see in the lower right um, picture that there's um, a little scar you can see behind her ear, but, but doing very well. Face is working. The tumor's out, and she's happy. So switching gears a little bit to thyroid cancers. We also deal with thyroid cancers. Um, I'm just going to talk about anaplastic thyroid cancer today. Um, we deal with all kinds of thyroid um, lesions, um, including benign lesions, but also um, well-differentiated cancers. But anaplastic thyroid cancer is a different beast. It's the most aggressive thyroid cancer. It's rare, but it still accounts for more than 50% of thyroid cancer deaths, and the median overall survival is only six months. It's associated with invasion of the airway, and that's... Um, you know, as we take this out, we have to frequently deal with tracheal reconstruction, um, because the, the tumor can involve the trachea or the larynx. Um, but some recent advances in the team that we have here has been working on this, um, targeting BRAF mutant anaplastic thyroid cancer. About 45 or close to half of these patients will have mutants in the BRAF gene. And these tumors can now be treated with MET inhibition and BRAF inhibition. Uh, especially if they're unresectable or if they have different metast uh, distant metastasis. And the idea is to continue this therapy until they become resectable and then resect them, and then you can continue therapy afterwards. Next slide. 
Here's our team, uh, Jeff Lovebergs in ENT and uh, Sid Sheff I showed you earlier in medical oncology. You've seen both of those guys' pictures and Larry Kim's in surgical oncology. But basically, much like our squamous cell carcinoma team, this is an integrated uh, clinical and research team. Um, there's a multidisciplinary endocrine tumor board where these uh, patients are, are discussed. And there's a clinical trial that's going to be opening soon for um, advanced disease patients with, with this tumor. Next slide. I'll just show you some of um, the people that I owe a lot of the things I showed you in this slide, uh, in this talk related to. Um, um, the oncology lab, you can see the members there. Natalia Isaiba is, uh, leads our HPV associated research and Travis Schrank is a surgeon who's recently gotten a K award. Um, the Yale Head and Neck Spore, we, we have a spore in Head and Neck Cancer that Barbara Burton leads, and we have a project on that. We deal a lot with um, immunotherapy for Head and Neck Cancer. You can see the people there, including Jared Weiss, um, who um, leads our um, clinical trials group. And you can see the Head and Neck Surgeons there that um, provide um, a lot of the treatment that we talked about today. So that's, I think, all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. All right, Dr. Yarborough, thank you so much. Let me uh, go ahead and advance to this question slide, and I need to bring up something over here so that I can uh, take care of those as those come in. Um, I, I did have one question for you while we're waiting for others to ask questions. Um, you had meant, you had talked earlier on in the presentation about the uh, HPV vaccine now being uh, eligible for everyone up to uh, 45 years of age. Uh, do you anticipate that that age will go up at any point, and would there be utility to that happening? Yeah, yeah that's a really good question. Um, people are exploring um, the use of that vaccine even in cancer patients, you know, for people who have cancer. The age range has been extended already quite markedly. At first, it started out there was a limit of just in women up to age 27, and in men for a, 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 a shorter time frame, even younger. So now that has been extended. I suspect it will stay at that age for people who do not have cancer, but people are looking um, at extending that and using the vaccine as part of therapy for people who are older. I do see a question from Margaret, um, and thanks for the question, Gully, about which HPV positive cancer patients need TRAF or CYLD mutation or deletion testing. Um, right now, that test is not approved um, for by the FDA for, um, for testing. We are doing a prospective trial right now to determine um, if it, it can be put, uh, can be FDA approved. Um, as soon as that trial is completed, we'll know if this can be a, a useful marker to predict who is going to do well with therapy or, and who not. And I, I suspect after that, we'll, we will also use it in a large clinical trial as a stratifying um, marker so that we can compare patients who have those defects with patients who do not and are being treated similarly on a clinical trial. But, but that's a great, great question, and that's exactly where we want to end up is with the lab test to um, help us predict who's going to do well or not. All right, and we have another question that just came in, and uh, Poll Everywhere is being a little finicky. Oh, there it is. Uh, is there any work being done to test people for HPV uh, for surveillance and treatment rather than just vaccine? Um, there is some work related to surveillance. Um, it's not really a treatment right now, but um, cert there, there's a few companies out that, are, that have a circulating tumor HPV test. Um, and it's basically where after somebody has been treated with the HPV positive cancer, you can draw blood, look for circulating HPV DNA. Um, and that test is also not FDA approved, um, but there are some um, early um, results that suggest that it's useful for being able to detect recurrences earlier. And so um, even though it's not FDA approved, it is available and um, it is sometimes being used to help us know 
to surveil patients more aggressively. Right. Thank you. And then another, are muscle attachments altered with these flap surgeries or are landmarks recreated to preserve muscle action? Yeah, it's really a great question. Um, most of the time, these the, the flap reconstructions that we are doing are not um, innervated flaps. Um, we do innervate some flaps, but mostly for sensation. Um, because it's hard to bring up um, muscle, get the orientation correctly for the muscle, and have it function like muscles that we are taking out. Um, the muscles that we're taking out are pretty specialized muscles. The main ones that um, people would be concerned with would be things that move the face, and those are, are muscles that are very hard to replace. Um, just because of their location and their attachments. Um, also, the tongue, um, and right now we, no one has been successful at uh, reconstructing a tongue that moves with, with muscle um, because it's a very complex um, interaction with all the surrounding muscles. But that's, that's a, that would be wonderful if we can get to that point. Absolutely. Um, one more that came in, and thank you all so much for submitting these great questions. Uh, are there any trials investigating the use of tumor treatment fields, electrical therapy, on any of these cancers? Um, I may not know exactly what the uh, electrical therapy for tumor treatment fields um, is. Uh, I'm not aware of any trials um, using anything like that. I do know there are some trials that look at the radiation treatment fields um, that can be um, reduced to decrease the amount of tissue that's getting radiated. So people are looking at that. Okay. And Dr. Yarbrough, um, you mentioned that uh, cancers occurring in the tonsils are quite common. Uh, do people who have had tonsillectomies have a decreased risk? Interesting yeah. question. Yeah, great question, great question, and um, right on target. Yes, people who had tonsillectomies are at decreased risk. Now, you can still get an HPV-associated cancer if you've had a tonsillectomy because the back of the tongue also has tonsil-like tissue on it, um, and some of these tumors occur there, but it, it, there is definitely a decreased risk, and people have looked at Part of the increase in HPV-associated cancers correlated with the time when everybody started getting their, stopped getting their tonsils out in the 60s. Um, so most people who get HPV-associated head and neck cancers are in their 50s or later 50s. So you can imagine they might have been exposed, you know, when they were teenagers or 20 years old. And so there have been people that looked at that interesting connection between decreasing tonsillectomies and rise 40 or 50 years later in um, tonsillar cancer. Gotcha. Got interesting. Well, thank you to, to our audience for all of these great questions. Um, we really appreciate that. Uh, let, me, let me say a few things in wrapping up. Uh, we want to say thank you to uh, the, the support from the citizens throughout North Carolina uh, and through the, the General Assembly for the University Cancer Research Fund and the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, we also want to thank Mary King, Veneranda Obore, and John Powell for all of their tireless work on each and every one of these lectures.